Welcome back, inebriates. Um, I don't know if, if hopefully you heard the last couple episodes and we recently had on one of the founders of uh, MOBA, the Museum of Bad Art. And a lot of times at the end of um, interviews, people are like, oh, you know who you should talk to? And this was one of those instances where uh, we get referred to uh, Jerry Riley, uh, who runs Newton Nomadic Theater. Welcome to the show, Jerry. Oh, thanks for inviting me. So... Uh, what is a nomadic theater? I mean, that, that I suppose that's the first big question. Yeah, uh, and the nomadic theater is kind of a unique theater. Um, we started about nine years ago, and and you know, part of it is that um, I had no previous to this, I had no theater experience. So basically, um, I can, we kind of stumbled into this. I think if I had any theater experience, I probably would have thought this is a ridiculous <laughs> idea. Um, but basically, um, I, you know, I ran into somebody in our neighborhood who, who it turned out was just a great actor. Um, and I thought, well, you know, started talking to her and, you know, asking where she, you know, uh, where she's been working. And we got talking. I said, you know, we should start a theater, you know, in, in our town. There's no theater here. So we didn't have a premises. We didn't have, a, you know, we didn't have anything. Um, so just out of a pr- sort of practical thing, I started started i came up with this idea of well let's see if we can get people to lend us a space and uh and we'll just sort of use the space for night so we did this first play and it ran for like five weeks and we had i don't know six venues and we would be you know one place for a night or two then the next week would be another place for a night or two and the next week another place you know so um so we've been and ever since that's kind of how we run the theater so what makes the theater unique is we have no staff, we have no rent, we have just about no expenses. So all the money that comes in the door goes to the actors and directors. So even though we're this tiny little theater, we actually pay the actors as well as some of the big theaters. Um, and, uh, you know, because um, we, don't have, uh, we don't have any expenses. And at this point, we've got a whole circuit of venues that we use. Um, but the other thing that makes it unique from the point of view of an actor is, and this is something I was totally oblivious of, is that, you know, doing things this way is kind of completely at odds with how actors typically work. Um, okay. Which, you know, I, I didn't know anything about this, but basically, you know, the much more typical thing for an actor is when they rehearse a play, you know, they rehearse in the space that they're going to be performing in and they kind of map out, you know, where they're going to be every instant of the play and re- in relation to the other actors, in relation to the set, in relation to the stage. And it's kind of like that's typically part of the process for most actors is sort of blocking out all the movements. Yeah. But, what it, you know, for our theater, what happens is they, you know, they, they show up on opening night. They've rehearsed in one place and then they show up on opening night and the stage is maybe not what they expected. Maybe it's wider and narrower and um then, you know, they come back a night or two later and we're in a different space and the stage is a totally different shape. And so, you know, it's it's a tough thing at first for actors, but, you know, we usually what happens by the time they get to the end of the run, they're usually really enthusiastic. Like, I could do this anywhere now. I could do it on a you know, street corner. Um, uh, you know, it's just because it kind of loosens them from the, the, this very sort of constricted physical thing. Um, so it's been a great thing. And the other thing that's great for the audience is, is that, you know, we, we bring theater right into your neighborhood. So we're, we're, you know, we're in the town of Newton mostly, and we'll move around every couple of nights. So, you know, we're taking some place that maybe, you know, right in your neighborhood and turning it into a theater for a night. So it's like a rug store or a pub or a barn or a library or something. Um, and people love, you know, being able to just sort of go down the street to to the theater you know that's a cool idea now i feel like that would help the the performer kind of stay focused on what they're doing i I know a lot of um musicians that play like in bars and whatnot and it's like the same night after night after night and they kind of almost hit like an autopilot level where they're just kind of like rolling through it, do the actors seem to, to like that because it prevents them from kind of going into autopilot and having to really think about like, where am I moving and why, you know, that kind of thing. 
Uh, they they do. I think at first it's usually stressful for them, but I think once they get into it, yeah, they kind of like it that it's. Uh, and oh, and the other thing that's very funny um, is every show we've ever done, uh, we always do the last performance uh, down the street from my house at a, a, a local pub. It's called Dungarens, mm -hmm. and there's not a worse possible place to do theater than Dungarens. <laughs> Um, okay. It just makes no sense at all. And uh, the place that serves as our stage is when you come in the door, the front door of the place, that's the stage right there. And from the wall on this side to the bar is about six feet. Oh, so that's the stage. And um, so when we do this, you know, the play and, and uh, it's at some point the actors hear that we're going to be doing this thing at this pub and they go by the pub and they all the reaction is always there is no possible way we can do this play in that space um and you know we say no what's going to happen and they're like it can't it can't be done you know and then by the time we get to the last night and the or the, uh, the last show we throw out half the set we just you know <laughs> we basically and just cram it into this little little place and people love it um, you know, part of the thing, part of the appeal of the theater is, is um, you know, it's small audience. Typically, yeah. we top out at about 50, 60 people because even if you have a huge space, because there's no stage, the sight lines are the limiting factor. So you can't you can't go many rows deep or else nobody's going to be able to see. No, we can see, right? Yeah. So it's small audiences and they're right up close, up front. So it's very, very intimate. And uh and you know, and it's pretty stripped down from a point of view of sets. So you're feeling very, very like connected with the audience. Uh, you know, you're almost on the stage with the actors, and people love that. Have you done? Have you done a play that, in hindsight, you're like, okay, that that play was not a good choice for what we're doing? Um, kind of yes and no. Um, we did one play that was totally at odds with what we normally do. Um, it was a, like a completely over the top spoof. It was called uh, uh, Dracula, the Bloody Truth. Okay. And it was a British group um, sort of put this show together. And it's um, my partner in the theater, this actor, Linda Getz, she saw this online and became obsessed with it and said, we've got to do this play. And I said, Linda, this is ridiculous. It's like, it's too big. There's just no way you can do it. And you need all the sets and all, this, all, all the stuff that we don't normally do. So uh, we, she was unrelenting, and eventually we did the play. Uh, we had to restrict it. We, we didn't do our normal venues because it couldn't be done. It had to be uh, physically big because of a very, bunch of stuff in the set. So we sort of limited it to three venues that we could accommodate this thing. So that was completely at odds with what we normally do. Um, but I did enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and the audience did as well. Um, so, uh, you know, but uh, it's so we've done this for, I don't know, eight, eight years, I guess, um, until COVID hit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and since COVID, we've done a numbers of things, but we've never really kind of got back into our normal groove. Um, and uh, a couple of times we started up and then kind of one step forward, two steps back, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's been kind of that rocky thing for everybody. And. Is that like, no, I mean, normally in theater, you would have understudies. Is it something that you even have to have more of now? Because of, you know, once one person gets COVID, I'm assuming it could run through a, a, a cast pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that that would be a big issue. And that's kind of one of the things uh, we typically have. I mean, one of the things with our, our theater is when pick and plays, we really are kind of constrained to it has to be a small cast we can't do typically five is usually about our top you know ca cast size so um so that makes it a little bit easier in terms of you know we're not we're not packing 25 people on a small stage that are going to start spreading things uh, yeah. but even with four or five people you know yeah that's an issue it can be um so our most recent uh, uh one of our most recent ones um was since COVID, we did this very uh, kind of crazy play. It's called White Rabbit, Red Rabbit. And um, 
it was written by an Iranian playwright about 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. And this guy can't leave the country for political reasons. He's, he's not allowed to leave the country. So he wrote this play and he sent it out into the world. And, um, and the play has one actor. The actor can be a man or a woman, can be any age. And the actor turns up on the night. Oh, and the one rule is the actor can't ever have seen this play or ever have read this play. Okay. And the actor turns up on the night, walks up on the stage, and we hand him an envelope with the script. They open up the envelope and they begin. And um, so every so we did three nights with three different actors, three really good actors. And it was the craziest thing. It was wonderful, but it was bizarre. And it's sort of like the it's sort of like the playwright is the actor is like the voice of the playwright, and the playwright is messing with the audience and doing all this stuff. But that was our most recent one. But the, in terms of COVID, it made it very easy because it's you know one person, no interaction, and uh, no rehearsals, actor, <laughs> no rehearsal for the actor. Yeah. It was a great gig because it's only one actor, no rehearsals, and you get the whole box office. So they did very oh, well. That's great. For that. Yeah. So how do you find plays like that? I mean, it, it seems like those seem they seem obscure to me. I'm not in the theater world, so it, they could be very commonly known. But between Dracula, Bloody Mess, and was it White Rabbit, Red Rabbit? White Rabbit, Red Rabbit, yeah. We um we kind of stumbled from one thing to another. A lot of time, I mean, a lot of stuff we've done in very well-known plays as well. Um, typically, you know, most theaters would have like a season. They would, you know, mm -hmm. you, they could tell you at the beginning of the season, this is what we're going to do for the year. We we never do that. We sort of stumble from one thing to the next. So when we finish one play, we never have any idea what's going to be the next play. But it's sort of it's kind of an organic thing. But it's typically we you know it's uh, most often we we if we connect with like directors, and then director you know oftentimes the director will bring the play. Um, sometimes the actors you know one of the actors will bring a play, but. Um, you know, we I generally don't get involved too much in the picking of the plays because you don't want me involved. I'm not very good at uh, yeah. Re especially, I, I can't read a play and make sense out of it. You know, um, we've done a number of plays where I've re read the script and I'm like, really, we're going to do this? And then, you know, then you see it on stage and it, it works. You know. Yeah, yeah. Because once you put the set and the you know the actors and yeah. And whatnot, yeah. Now. You said you didn't intend to start this and it, it just like it seems very, very organic and just kind of go with the flow, which is very much my work model as well. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had instance where we were supposed to have like a, a farmer's market and we show up and we have in our mind plotted out like where all the vendors are going to go. And then unbeknownst to us, there was some sort of road race. And now there's 15 porta potties where there was supposed to be 12 <laughs> vendors and yeah, yeah. um it, have you had any of those experiences where you kind of had your basic all right like oh, i know this venue it's always this way and then you go in there's a pool table or, or something that totally throws you off yeah yeah we do we definitely have that and uh um you know and it's 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 and yeah you have to be able both the actors and we have to be able to um uh, kind of you know be a little nimble when it comes to dealing with stuff like that um, and, you know, typically it's, uh, it's, like I say, it's, um, it's not as hard because like I say, the, the, the nature of the day to day is they're, they're doing that anyway. So mm -hmm. if you throw something new, you know, people can figure out how to work around it, you know, cause they're not locked into one, um, one thing. So yeah, we have our surprises from time to time, but, uh, try to keep them at a minimum, you know? Yeah. And where do you find your actors? Do they, I mean, do they come seek you out or? Um, we, you know, we, we, we've had over the years, we've had a, 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 a number of people who work with us regularly. Um, typically, you know, in most plays, we like to at least bring in some new blood, usually a mixture of actors we've worked with and some new people. Mm -hmm. so a lot of times it's word of mouth, you know, a director maybe brings somebody in or uh, one of the other actors. Um, sometimes we do, you know, uh, um, auditions, you know, public auditions, and um, uh, so it's kind of it's a, it's a mixed bag of where we get the actors. 
Um, but uh, we've um, we've lost a couple of our uh, our regulars uh, recently, so we're we're going to have to recruit some some new regulars. I think as um, a few people have moved away and uh, um, to one to another country and two to another state. So. Mm -hmm. um, so are you looking to ramp back up to your normal production schedule? Or I know you said it didn't really, you didn't have like a season or whatever, but are you looking to kind of get things back to normal now? Um, I guess, I don't know. I'm not quite, I'm not, I'm not quite feeling it right at the moment, but we are thinking about doing a couple of things um, more, you know, I guess scale down or more one-off things. Uh, we got this very vague idea that we're putting together right now of, um, you know, I've always been a big fan of like when it comes time for the Oscars, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, there's usually like these things you can go see at some local theater, which is, you know, the Oscar nominated animations or the Oscar nominated short, short, you know, documentaries or something. Yep. like that. And I'm always a fan of those because you go and you see like, uh, um, you know, this selection of five or 10 minute, you know, movies. And you know, if one of them's kind of a dud, that's okay because there's another one right behind it. Sure, and I yeah. kind of like that. So we're thinking of doing something with theater that was kind of that flavor, a bunch of short little things, and we're trying to get a handle on how we would do this. And one of the sort of side effects of if we if we do this is we'll be able to rope in a bunch of actors. It's an easy ask for actors because it's mm -hmm. short pieces, um, and we can get a bunch of new people in in the theater working with to see who you know we like working with so we're already been talking to a number of actors and that might be the next thing but we we got our work to do it's kind of right now it's just a vague idea rather than a project ready to go yeah that sounds like a, a cool idea we we've recently started doing comedy shows and i find as long as that dud isn't the last comic yeah everyone has a good time it's like when they don't like the last comic where they kind of that's what they remember yeah. exactly yeah so it's like they rate the whole show based on that last comment. Um, you know, we do. Uh, so when we're not doing the plays, the other thing we've done since day one um, is in between when we do plays, we do, um, uh, you know, the uh, Moth Radio Hour. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we do these events like that. We call them Nomad Story Slams. And, and it's, you know, anybody come throw their name in the hat and tell a five-minute story. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying with the comedy, it's the same thing. It's like, as long as the last story is not the dud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so how do you do do those? I know like moths sometimes are themed. Um, and like, are they, I think it was just before COVID, they started one uh, down here at the Plymouth Library. And it was one of those things I wanted to check out. And it just never, never happened. And then when COVID rolled in, it just kind of went away. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you schedule those? Do you kind of like pick a theme or is it just people can tell whatever story they want to tell? No, we, we, we pick a theme like the, just like the moth and, uh, you know, and the themes you, you pick a theme to that can kind of be pushed and pulled in various directions, you know, nothing too specific. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it's kind of fun sometimes people like how people can take some story they want to tell and somehow stretch it and turn it to connect it to a theme. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we do those. And one of the things about those is those are sort of money makers for the theater. So, you know, that's kind of what funds, you know, we have a certain amount of stuff of like we need, you know, lights and sound equipment, things like that. And so the, the story slams sort of fund our just general expenses, you know. So how much stuff are you loading in and out of these locations? I mean, I, I, it didn't occur to me about lights, but yeah, you would probably need like spotlight and, and whatnot. I mean, you said it's a minimal set, but do you have like the backdrops and, you know, painted backdrops or is it more just a couch or whatever? Yeah, it, 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 it varies, you know, play to play, of course, but, uh, but the, the lights, you know, we, we typically have a, a sound system, fairly simple sound system, mostly, you know, like mostly it's for uh, background music and stuff beforehand. So that, that, but that would be pretty minimal. Um, we have a uh, uh, you know pipe and drape you know mm -hmm. that is yeah yeah sure. the, the back the back drop and you know we have a couple of different colors that can be sometimes we'll lay stuff on top of the pipe and drape you know maybe some gauzy things to give it certain looks um, 
sometimes things are hung, you know, maybe there's a picture, or, uh, you know, and you hang that on the drape. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's usually pretty minimal. And then there might be, yes, yeah, some furniture. There might be like a table or a chair or a couch or something like that. And, you know, and then for lights, we typically have, uh, uh, it's all LED lighting because one of the things is you're going into somebody's, you go into these places and you have no idea what you're plugging into. So it can't be, you know, <laughs> something that's yeah. going to suck a lot of power. Yeah. Um, so we've got these wireless LED lights, which are great. They're on tripods. So we have two tripods full of lights either side. And then we have another tripod that we can put like uh, a spotlight, you know, somewhere in the back. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have a fair amount of stuff gets hauled in and out. And and we come with the, some, most places don't have chairs. Some, some of them do, but we have, you know, we have our own chairs. So we bring those in, um, in most venues. So. So it's a it's a it's a lot of hauling hauling stuff in and out, and the actor we, actors are great. I mean, it's part of the gig for the actors is you're to help gonna, out. You're going to be part of that, yeah. Yeah, that, that's cool. And and I think you know it, it's funny because you said you had no experience in theater and and uh, you know you start referencing lighting and 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 pipe and drape. It's like it's it's one it's one of my favorite things about what I do and like how weird my life is. Like I didn't know anything about sound editing. And then we start a podcast and I didn't know anything about video editing and we have some YouTube shows and it's like, you just kind of like figure it out. And, and I, I kind of love that stumbling your yeah. way through things. And I guarantee there's stuff we do that there's easier ways to do it. We just don't know about it. Um, but I mean, is that part of what you enjoy about it? Is that kind of discovery? Yeah, of absolutely. That I mean, that is my personality. Like you, exactly what you just described. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife says that my motto is always, how hard can it be? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm ready, always ready to, like, just, you know, plunge into anything and kind of love love that part, the uh, sort of being over your head and, you know, figure it out and uh, and how hard can it be and making it up as you go along, you know. And like yeah, you said, I, sometimes you just, you know, there's way easier ways you find out the, the 10th time you're doing this that, you know. Yeah. There was some, uh, you should be doing something totally different. Or someone's just like, why don't you do it this way? And you're like, because that never occurred to me before to do it that way. <laughs> and uh, when you're talking about the, the when the, the lighting and the, and the venue and plugging into things, it's like we've been to some really weird um, spaces and uh, we, we do like art events as well. And we were in one that used to be a Chinese food restaurant. And so they have like the overhead lighting that they didn't necessarily change all the light bulbs out of. So randomly they're red for some reason. <laughs> and so I'm looking at all the paint and instead of like being your heavy reds and your browns and your oranges, yada, 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 everything is a vague shade of red. And I'm looking at, I'm like, I don't know. Like I can't even tell what colors I'm looking at anymore. And it's, it's always that every venue has that struggle that like, once you kind of figure it out, you're like, all right, this is, you know, we're going to this place and these are the things that we have to do to, yeah, yeah. you know, to counteract. And yeah, I never even thought about drawing too much power. That's uh, I'm sure that'll happen to us at some point. Well, you know, the first couple of shows, the first two or three shows, when we started the theater, our first set of lights was, you know, I just kind of stumbled on these, I don't know, about a week ago down in the basement. And I was, they was kind of cracking me up seeing it now. Cause you know, the first show, I went out to Home Depot and I bought a bunch of like long extension cords mm -hmm. and uh, like clip lights. Sure. Yeah. I have a few of those LEDs, kicking around. <laughs> LEDs. And then I bought a, um, like, I don't know, uh, six or eight um, dining room dimmers, you know, like on your wall. For a oh, yeah. Switch. Yeah. And mounted them. I made this wooden box with these dimmers in it and electrical outlets on the back. And that was my lighting board and then plugged extension cords and these clip lights. So for the first two or three shows, that was our, our stuff was this, uh, you know, lighting courtesy of a uh, Home Depot. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's, that's one of those you just kind of figure out. And it's, I, I always find that it's, um, well, I think Adam Savage, uh, I don't know if you know who he is. He, he was yeah. on Mythbusters and he has this great logic of, if you're going to buy something, you buy the cheapest one you can. And then if you start using it on the regular basis, then you buy the most expensive one you can afford. 
Okay. I like and, that. It's, and I'm like, yeah, because like when we first started doing podcasting, I think we spent 60 bucks on the mic because we're like, we don't, we don't want to waste money if we don't know we're going to use it. And, mm-hmm. you know, same thing with your lighting board. When you're starting off, I can't, I can't imagine you thought you would be where you are now. No, no, definitely not. Um, so uh, uh, let me tell you about a, a, a event we did recently. I just love this because, you know, it's really, <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't know, about five years ago, I first had a vague idea. And every time I mentioned it, everybody it is involved in theater rolls their eyes and go, this is Jerry's ridiculous idea again. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, so this summer, though, it came to fruition. Oh, that's great. exciting. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happened was um, uh, a director who we used to work with um, does this stuff down on Martha's Vineyard. Um, and it's, it's a group called uh, Shakespeare for the Masses. Okay. And we've never done any Shakespeare previous to this. And uh, she said that they have one of their, 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 their thing is kind of like Shakespeare for beginners, you know? So it's sort of like, um, you know, presenting Shakespeare to an audience maybe has never seen it before and uh, in kind of a digestible form. So they're like hour long things and it's the words of the play, but sort of pulled apart with a narrator to kind of make it, you know, a little more understandable. And, and Okay. And yeah, sure. Easier. So she said, we have this one play called uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet and Juliet and Juliet. And basically, <laughs> Okay. You know, it's the it's the words of the play. Yeah. But they have like five actors. And one of them is Romeo, and then everybody else is a Juliet. So there's a a young ingenue Juliet. There's an old woman as Juliet. There's a guy as Juliet, and it's this kind of madcap version of you know Romeo and Juliet. So we're gonna do this thing, and I said, wait a minute, we can do this with my idea, and everybody rolls their eyes, and uh, so we did this thing. So the idea was we announced this thing that we're doing two two performances of this play. It's going to be on a Saturday afternoon. They're going to be outside. Yeah. Um, it's free, but you need tickets. You know, sure, sure. a limited number of tickets. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you sign up for the tickets, we'll tell you when it is, but we won't tell you where it is. So the idea is that on the day before the play, we're going to send you an email and tell you to go somewhere. And when you get there, we'll give you a clue. And if you follow the clues, you'll find the theater and see the show. So it's kind of like one part scavenger hunt, you know, yeah. uh, uh, whatever. So we do this thing and we set it up and uh, we get it all set. We're going to go do it. And, and we've got this place where we're going to have it is on public property in the city of Newton. And I talked to uh, somebody at City Hall and they said, you know, can I get permission to use that? They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got a whole streamlined process for, you know, getting things in. There's a website and you just go on there. So I'm kind of going down the, the this path and uh, we're putting the whole thing together and and uh, and we've got a sponsor. Normally we don't have sponsors, but we had because we wanted this to be free. Right. We've got a sponsor and they're going to, you know, do that. And that's great. And then I go to get the permit for the city. And this kind of goes back to where we started today, where you're talking about your Oh, yeah. with permits. Yep. Um, I go in there and it's like, oh, yeah, it's all very straightforward. Just enter this information. And one of the items of the information is enter the uh, your policy details for uh, a, a insurance policy that for at least a million dollars that indemnifies the city. Yep. Oh, I'm yeah. Like, they don't have yeah. one of those. <laughs> they don't have one of those, and I'm not getting one of those. Yeah. So I, you know, called the person I've been dealing with is, um, this arts organization say, well, we're going to have to pull the plug on this thing. It's just not, you know. And uh, so she was all excited about it. And she's like, oh, no, you can't. And I said, well, I, you know, I just can't do this. And she goes, yeah, I know this insurance thing is ridiculous. But um, all right. So the next morning she calls me up, says, you know, I was thinking about that all last night. And I just hate to see you cancel this thing. And she said, I've got this idea. She said, "Um, the mayor of Newton lives about a block and a half from there. And she said, uh, ask the mayor if you can do it in her backyard. She's got a beautiful backyard. So I asked the mayor, um, who's very approachable, and I know, know yeah. her, you know, whatever. And she said, absolutely, no problem. So anyway, what happened was on the day, these people get sent to a movie theater on Route 9. Mm-hmm. They get there. They get the clues. The clues send them across the parking lot and into the woods. And they go on this mile long road uh, serpentine route through these woods yeah cross railroad tracks 
They go into a park, beautiful park, through the park, out the other side, and then uh, they're on a little side street, and they walk down two doors in, in, a, in, in, a, in a gate and into somebody's backyard. There's 50 chairs in the stage, but they have no idea where they are. And then, you know, we sort of do the introductions, and we say our theater depends on the generosity of people who lend us their space, and we like to mm -hmm. bring out the homeowner who's donated his space, and the mayor comes out, and everybody realizes they're in the mayor's backyard. So it was a great, great fun thing. So. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we um... – Dealing with stuff like that is is always you, you never realize how much paperwork you're going to go through. Um, one of our events recently, and we got the approval from the town and blah, blah, blah. And then as we're moving forward, they're like, oh, did you get permission from the Army Corps of Engineers? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, well, the parking lot belongs to the Army Corps of Engineers and it's a park. And I'm like, so if I just go to the park and just park in the parking lot. I don't need anyone's permission, but since I'm running something in the park, now I have to get permission for people to show up and park in the parking lot. And they're like, yes. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's just this baffling barrage of paperwork and weird, like, you know, hiccups that just never ends. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mostly try to uh, avoid dealing with that stuff, you know, from experience, I just know I hate dealing with it and it's, and I tend to, but, I, I do end up doing stuff regularly and it's always difficult. Like we do an event every year. It's not the theater. It's a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, I think I'm kind of like you, I get involved with a bunch of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's in their neighborhood. It's called the feast of the falls. And it's, uh, there's a, a bridge that goes over gorge over the Charles river. And it's in a, a beautiful park. It's called Hemlock Gorge. Well, the bridge is is owned by the MWRA, the water company, you know, the water. Yeah. Company. But the park is the DCR, which is the state organization. So you've got multiple jurisdictions, and we're going to mm -hmm. do this thing on the on the aqueduct, which is the you know the bridge when it comes across. So we put like a four hundred foot long table uh, down the aqueduct, and we bring in a, a a mobile kitchen, and we cook dinner for sit down gourmet dinner for four hundred people, and it's oh, free. Wow. It's free if you live in the neighborhood. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So, but every year the permissions for this mm -hmm. take like four months to get the permissions. And yeah. and, the, and they always come in, you apply three or four months before. And it's always like the day before the event, you still don't have your permit. And they oh, the day before the event, they give you the permit and they go, oh yeah. And by the way, there's some requirements that, you know, you didn't know about. Yeah. So, we yeah. just made them up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We did a, a pop-up art show um as part of like a winter festival and they gave us this like um abandon's not the right word it was like in transition it was like a retail space that was something and basically it had been mostly not gutted but like there was no setup of anything it was basically just walls and so then they're like oh this is the space you're going to use and it was massive. So I started calling every artist I know and be like, whatever work you have, send it to me. Like, you know, <laughs> we need stuff. Art by the yard. Yeah, exactly. And um, then it got to the point where like a week out, they're like, oh, we don't have permission to use the building because it doesn't, it's not up to fire code. And I'm like, well, I have all this art coming. And and I'm like, should I just cancel? And they're like, no, 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 we're going to try to work around it. And I'm like, well, when am I going to find out? You know, we literally got the approval at noon the day of the art drop and which started at four <laughs> so it's just like i'm like i'm just gonna keep going forward and assume that everything is gonna work out fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and it turned into a huge success but it's just it, it's so stressful at the time but you know yeah. I, I think part of me does it more for the the stories afterwards <laughs> yeah yeah well, it is. It is. Uh, I mean, that is a stressful thing when you're, you know, y you know that you know, like the permits should come and they say they're going to come, but you know, but if they don't, I am totally screwed. You know. Right. Yeah. And it only takes one like crotchety person to like yeah. derail everything, and then you gotta call some people you know who knows the crotchety person, and be like, can you, you know, talk to this person and make them less angry. Um, 
yeah so it's but i mean that's, that's part of the job i guess is, i mean is this all you do is is the the theater is that no, just kind no, of no 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 uh, that's just uh, that's just uh, like, i just do that for fun on the side yeah um no i actually have a real real job um most freelance software guy yeah and, and that's one of those like everyone's like everyone's like oh you you work too much you work too much i'm like i this is kind of what I did before it was my job too. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, it is that weird. So what, now what is your, your, what is your thing? What's your. So we, it's so complicated to explain because it started off as just like a group of artists that hung out at a bar and drew mm -hmm. and we met once a week and we hung out and for like three years, I think it was like every Thursday you know, sometimes there's a couple of us, sometimes there was a bunch of us and sometimes you drank more and sometimes you drew more. And then it just kind of became this ever escalating thing where people were like, oh, you know, it'd be cool. And I'd be like, yeah, it would be cool. Let's do that. And um, so now we do all sorts of, you know, start off as just art. And now I say it's all arts you know, because we do stand up comedy and we're getting involved in the music scene and we do podcasts and we hang art for local businesses and we do vendor markets and farmers markets now, which we didn't intend to. It just kind of happened that way. And then people be like, oh, you know, where would be a good location. I'd be like that would be a good location. And then we do something there and you know, it just kind of goes out of control. Well, it's, it's funny because I've got a touch of that. It sounds like way, you got way, way, way more of it than I do. But um with the theater, I mean, I always kind of say our, the theater really is like our, our three ring circus that like mm -hmm. it's wide enough that, you know, we've done uh, a film uh, 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 debut, you know, like a screening of a film. We've done uh, music oh, cool. events. We've done yep. like, you know, kind of different things. We do the story slams and um, and it's all kind of under the the umbrella of the theater, you know. So, yeah. And that's the thing is like, so um we came up with the name Inebriart like way back in the day. And that just kind of is the umbrella company that everything else is under. And in some ways I love it. In other ways, I feel it handcuffs a, us a little bit because we've had events. Where people be like, well, I don't drink. I'm like, you don't have to drink, you know? Yeah. Um, but in the same aspect, I think it gives you kind of an expectation of we're not stuffy and we're, you know, we want to have fun and, and it's, you know, everyone's welcome. That's kind of our two rules is it has to be fun and everybody's welcome. Cause otherwise what's the point. Mm -hmm. And um, we just found this little niche that, you know, we work with mostly bars, brews and restaurants and, you know, we do we're, heck we're, uh, this year we're launching a comic con at a brewery. Cause why not? <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and, um, you know, been kicking around the idea of putting together a concert, but that's, a little more expensive and trying to figure out the budget on that. But um, yeah, it's just kind of like this constant finding new weird thing. Like you said, I, I really like the, like, how, you know, what hard thing can I do? You know, it's not how you phrased it. But. <laughs> well, you know, um, one of the, one of the things I, I uh, we did, we get, we get, when COVID came along, uh, we had just opened a play. Uh, it's called no exit. It's a pretty famous play. And uh, we ran, I think, Friday and Saturday night, and it was supposed to be like four more weeks after that, or five more weeks. And, you know, during the weekend, we kind of, we had heard like in the background, you know, some rumblings about something, I don't know, some virus, and you're not really paying any attention. Yep. But mm -hmm. by like Sunday, all of a sudden, it's on your radar. And by Monday, it's like turning into a big thing. And by Wednesday, the whole world shut down, you know, and yeah, all our yeah. bands like, that's, it's all over. So, you know, our actors, um, you know, the deal we have is um, they're typically rehearsing for maybe five weeks before the play opens. And then they get paid based on whatever the door is, you know, the money coming in. Well, in this case, they put their five weeks rehearsal time in. They've got two nights and now the show's shut down and right. we can't pay them, you know. Yeah. Uh, so um, which was, you know, horrible. So the first week, what the uh, the the week we shut down, we you know opened the show one week, COVID hit in the middle of the next week, and we kind of on on a on like a forty eight hours notice we said let's do a story slam on Friday night, and we'll do it on Zoom 
which I had never used before. And I just heard about this thing, Zoom. Yeah, me too. And, and now we're all experts. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I said, we'll do a story slam and we'll raise, we'll raise money. You know, we'll ask the audience to donate and, uh, and pass the hat to see if we can get um, mm-hmm. some, some money for the actors. So we did. So we did this uh, story slam and it, it was unlike our normal story slam. We kind of had, uh, we had lots of guests coming in and out and just turned it into this kind of uh, thing of like uh, various people connected with the theater and dropping in and out. And uh, uh, and we had the mayor kick it off and, you know, this kind of stuff. So we, you know, raised a, 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 some money, a couple hundred bucks came in, but, you know, not enough to pay them all, but just some of the buck. We had so much fun. We said, let's do some next week. So the next week we did um, – this thing, one of our actors is from Wales and she growing up, she said there was a thing called poems on a Sunday night on the, it was on the BBC, I think. And they would take requests from the audience um, of your favorite poem. You would write it, you know, write in and mm-hmm. then they would uh, uh, have famous actors come and do the poet, you know, do the poetry. Well, it's very funny because I'm missing the piece in my brain for poetry, like, you know, most poetry I read it and I, I just don't yeah, get I, it. I don't get it either. Yeah. Yeah. But like these guys were all excited, like, oh, yeah, sure. So we do this thing. So we, you know, this is like on a Sunday, we do, we send out an email to our, our audience, send us your favorite poems. Monday, Tuesday, all these poems come in. We round up like 25 actors, um, some of them scattered around the country because it's Zoom. Yeah. And we do this, you know, this, uh, this show on, on Sunday night. And the funny thing is, I loved it. And it was, you know, it's the same thing as the theater. I think re- reading poetry or reading a script, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. But if you have somebody who's good doing it, then I get it, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, the third week we did uh, uh, we did a, uh, a play that was a very simple play that suited itself to Zoom called uh, Love Letters. And normally we can't deal with equity actors because um, we're not an equity house. It's mm-hmm. a union. But in this case, the whole world was shut down. So we get these two great Boston equity actors who everybody knows to do the, you know, this Zoom play. So that was great. And then finally, the fourth week, I said, I want to do this thing. We're going to call it the Lunatic Talent Jamboree. And it's just <laughs> okay. going to be this like Zoom freak show, talent show, you know, some really horrible stuff, some wonderful stuff, just like this complete, you know, three ring circus thing. So we did that and we had some fabulous stuff and then just ridiculous stuff mixed in with it. You know, my neighbor down the street plays a tuba really badly. So we had 30 seconds of that dropped and then, you know, like all (laughs) just kind of, um, but after four weeks of, you know, four weeks of zoom stuff, um, we were kind of totally played out on, on it was like, that's no. And it was very funny because it was, it was, you know, it was the month after that, that, other arts organization were starting to get like come online, but by mm-hmm. that point it all played out, you know, for us. So that's so funny because my experience was almost identical. Um, so it wasn't long after you know COVID, where you know gigging musicians didn't have work, you know, yeah. and were having trouble getting unemployment because of their weird life and whatnot. And uh, my friend who owns a craft beer store. Uh, downtown Plymouth is like I want to talk to you and I'm like what's up she's like I want to have musicians in here after we close because they can't perform in public but after we close it'll be just them and you and she's like and I want you to live stream um, their music and you know we can put up like their Venmo and and ask people to, to, to make donations towards them so then I think we did like we did it every week, I think for like six or eight weeks. And we called it the seller session. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was a musician that was like playing in front of like a wall of wine. And but like a lot of musicians were doing it at that time, but they really liked it because I don't shut up. So I'm there and people are like making comment via, you know, um, Facebook and, and, and uh, YouTube. So like, as they're like typing in, so I'm asking the questions that people are asking. And so like, there was more interaction between mm-hmm. myself and the musician. So they're like, it didn't feel like I was just playing to the camera. They're like, I felt yeah. like it was a little more. And then I had reached out to a previous podcast guest that I stayed in touch with. And um, he was a stand up co- uh, comedian. And I'm like, Hey, how are, how are those virtual comedy shows? He's like, Oh, I heard some are good. So then 
I'm like, well, let's do it. And let's, you know, so we started doing it every other week and we called it non essential comedy. And then when COVID, you know, went away, we started ignoring it, whatever. Um, I'm like, well, I have all these brewery contacts and now we have like five shows a month that we run. And it's like, that's just how my brain works. It's like, it just, wow. You're so you're still doing it now. Yeah. Yeah. We had a show last night in the snowstorm. It was not a great turnout because mm-hmm. it was snowing like a bastard, but um, yeah, we, we had one, I think last Thursday that had a really great turnout Friday. We have our regular one in Carver that pretty much every time we do it sells out there about mm-hmm. 55, 60 people. And it's a lot of fun. Oh, it sounds good. I'll have to get down there for one of these. I'll have to get on your list. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I feel like um, it's either a great thing we met or a really terrible thing that we met. And then, you know, <laughs> we have that same mentality of like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> well, uh, you know, another uh, another COVID story that you get a kick out of maybe is, uh, um, you know, I don't know, when COVID hit, what, it was in March, I think? Yeah. Um, and, you know, thinking back, I'm sure if you remember it, those first couple of months were like unbelievable because, you know, first we thought it was going to be a couple of weeks and then it yeah. in a mm-hmm. month and then it was two months. And like virtually nobody was going out the door, you know, or like nobody was seeing anybody. And, you know, so it got to be like almost June and the city was still, our city was locked down. There was like no public events of any kind, no public gatherings. Right. And uh, so we got this idea um, and kind of floated it with working with the city because we knew this is very dicey, you know, public healthy sort of thing. And we said, we want to do this event and we want to, you know, we want to make sure it's safe and we want to make sure you'll sign, you know, sign off on it. So we called it the secret drive-in concert. Okay. We, we got, we basically, we got this local band, a uh, young band who's great. They call couch. And uh, we got uh, four, four identical. We got this contractor who had four identical pickup trucks and we said, you know, lend us your trucks. So we took these four trucks and parked them like, you know, separated so it was like you know social distancing for the band each band member got their own their own truck, truck yeah and and they're elevated and they're in this parking lot of a of a of an empty empty shopping center and you know part of the thing was we said you know the audience will be in their car and mm-hmm. they can't get out of the car and we'll pump the music into their car radio we'll have a big sound system there but yeah. also like a drive-in theater will pump it into your car radio mm-hmm. um and and you know and we'll keep everybody in the cars to be safe and uh and uh and i said the other thing is we won't we'll we'll, you know you'll need tickets and we won't tell you where it is until you get your tickets so that we don't have big crowds of people just just showing up yeah yeah so we we did this thing and um people were just so excited after being locked up for three months for the first time to be out in public even in the car and the band started playing and it was the band said it was just totally surreal because they're up on these pickup trucks and they can't see any faces they're just looking at a, the know, cars yeah. a huge parking lot full of cars yeah um and uh and then they play their first song and it's kind of weird and they get to the end and then all of a sudden there's like 100 cars beeping their horns <laughs> <laughs> and they're like okay and then you know the party really took off from there yeah. so yeah, those, it's going to be weird days. Like, I feel like, you know, grandkids or, you know, whatever, you're going to be like trying to explain it to them. And they're going to be like that. That's so strange. And it, it was a weird, weird thing to live through. Yeah. You know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, you know, an artist, uh, uh, but I did. Can I show you a piece of art I did make? Oh, sure. Okay. Hold on one second. Can you read that? Let's see. Okay. Ce- celebration of negativity. Yeah. Rejoice in the negativity, recoil from the positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> How many tests is that? I don't know. It was about uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen. Fifteen COVID tests. Wow. Neg- negative COVID tests. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah, that'll be a memento for somebody to stumble on a hundred years from now, somewhere you know. Nice. But uh, I mean, this this time has flown. I feel like you know we're just getting to know each other. But uh, where can people go to find out more information about the Newton Nomadic Theater? Uh, Newton Nomadic Theater, uh, that's E R, not R E Theater. Uh, dot org, 
And uh, if you go there and just get on our mailing list, that's the best way. And uh, every time, you know, we do something, we'll get a hold of you by email. Excellent. And I know you're on Facebook. Are you on other social yeah. medias? Uh, no, just Facebook and, and uh, website. And cool. That's pretty much it. Well, Jerry, this is a lot of fun. I feel like, you yeah. know, kindred spirit. And uh, we wish you the best of luck with, with your future silly endeavors and i think it's fantastic and, and how, um, do I get on, how do i get on your list oh uh inebriart.com that's uh okay. i-n-e-b-r-i hyphen a-r-t.com and there's a a little spot you can sign up for the emailing list and find out all the stuff we're doing great and um for our listeners thanks for listening we'll catch you guys again next week and thanks for checking out the show today, listeners. Uh, if you enjoyed the content today, you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show. You can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out. You can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions, complaints, and concerns. Or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on Instagram. And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.